Hi, everyone. Welcome to Floss Ed's Newer Tech Group. I'm terribly excited to have Michael Gaziano here today with us. I do want to do a tiny bit of housekeeping before. That's literally just going to take less than a minute. But many of you will be joining us for our in-person workshop this year. And that will be in Oxford, well, a little over a month from now. And it's going to be on whole brain emulation in particular with a focus for AI. So can we do anything useful with whole brain emulations now? After Anders Sandberg wrote the roadmap on that in 2008, what new capabilities are online and how would they affect AI on the very, very long term? We have wonderful folks already attending. I know that many of you here will be joining for, will be joining us there. If you have an interest, we unfortunately have a wait list that is as long as the participant list right now. I'm bringing this up here because if you do have an interest in this topic in general, but can't make it to the in-person workshop, then I would really welcome you to reach out to me because we already did a virtual meeting on whole brain emulation for AI safety two months from uh, two months ago. And I'd be delighted to host another one. So if, if that sounds like roughly up your alley, there was a lot of appetite for doing something on that in a virtual setting. Again, I'm happy to host it. That's just to provide a little bit of context uh, for those of you who can't make the in-person meeting. Okay, well, that's enough for me now for much of the kind of like housekeeping bit. Now I'm really, really, really excited to have Michael Graziano here. Hi, Dali. And you'll be joining us. I know that we've been coordinating for a little while and you'll be discussing a conceptual framework for consciousness. I have lots of notes from Randall here that I want to share in the, in the discussion. But for now, yeah, please take it away. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on. I'll be in the chat monitoring for questions and then we can have a full-blown discussion like we usually do. Thank you very, very much for joining us. We are very excited to have you. Great. Thank you so much. And I will share my slides. There we go. And just to make sure those are visible now to everyone. They look great. Excellent. Well, thank you all. It is a pleasure to be here virtually. And I'm going to talk to you about the attention schema theory. It's a theory of consciousness in philosophy and, and in science. Co consciousness has come to mean a subjective experience of anything, any specific event, whether it's external, like a, a sensory event or internal, a thought or an emotion. Clearly, not all events processed by the brain have conscious experience associated with them. And, and, and an active field of study is trying to understand the, the mechanism and the adaptive value, if any, of, of conscious experience. Why is it there? Why would it have evolved? The attention schema theory is a mechanistic, demagicked, demystified theory. And it's a theory of many things. One part of the theory explains why people believe they have a conscious, consciousness magic inside of them. And another part of the theory explains why that particular self model has some really important cognitive functions. And the, the theory is buildable. I think the, the, the study of consciousness is more and more a matter of technology. Traditionally, it was all about philosophy, philosophy of mind. Then it became a part of psychology and, and neuroscience. But I think the study of consciousness has now moved into a different phase. It's becoming a part of artificial intelligence. People want to build human-like machines. They want to build AI that can interface effectively with people. Uh, but if you're an engineer, uh, consciousness is a fraught topic. You don't want to waste your time chasing magic. If somebody says, oh, just make it complicated enough, just make it integrated enough, give it some feedback loops or give it a global workspace and poof, a magic feeling will come out of it. Oh, uh, well, that's not super helpful to the engineer. Uh, and I think most existing theories of consciousness are essentially magical. There's always a point at which they say, and then the magic experience happens. It's like alchemy. You put in frog tongue and newt eye 
and then poof, magically consciousness is supposed to come out. It's called the explanatory gap. But there is a way to avoid the gap. So let me put it this way. Everything you think about yourself, no matter how sure you are that it's true, derives from information in your brain or you wouldn't be able to think it or, or believe it or, or, or say it. When we insist we have a subjective experience of something, we do so for one reason only. It's because there is some bundle of information constructed in the brain that is telling us that we have subjective experience. It's a self model and the brain's models are never accurate or complete. They can be pretty good, but they're never fully accurate. Human brains think they have a magical, non-physical essence of experience inside them. They think that for one and only one reason, bundles of information in the brain. If we understand those bundles of information, then we understand that whole process. The attention schema theory is a proposed account of the relevant bundle of information, the self model that makes us all so certain that we have a subjective experience. It's a, a, a theory of why that particular model is of adaptive use. I think that's why the attention schema theory has become light by computer scientists and artificial intelligence experts. It, it become popular in that domain. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard machine learning experts tell me, hey, finally, there's a theory that we can actually build. It's going to take study and, and development, but ultimately it's buildable and it, it points to specific practical benefits. So for this talk, I'll, I'll explain the conceptual framework, at least the main parts. And my goal is not to give you lots of scientific details. I, I, I've tried that in other talks and it just causes confusion. You can look up my data papers online or you can ask me afterward. We have a ton of psychology and neuroscience data. I think it's more important to get across the overarching ideas. If I can do that today, I'll be happy. The theory is at its heart, simple. It says that the brain constructs an attention schema. So what's that? I'll start with an analogy. It's a very close analogy. Another schema constructed by the brain, the body schema. The essential insights will transfer directly from the body schema to the attention schema. So let's start with that. Your physical body is represented in the brain by a bundle of information. The body schema represents the shape of the body, keeps track of posture and movement, and, and it makes predictions. It's probably constructed in a network of cortical areas, in, in including the parietal lobe and the motor and premotor cortex. It's necessary for the good control of movement. You need to monitor and predict what your body's doing to effectively control the body. That's a, a general principle of, of control engineering. Any control system needs a model of the thing it controls. The same brain networks are also involved in looking at someone else and interpreting the other person's stance and movements, M modeling someone else's body. In that sense, a, a body schema plays a significant role in social cognition. It's, it's often overlooked, but it's an important part of social interaction. And there's a third major consequence of having a body schema. Because higher cognition and, and language have some access to it. The body schema gives us an approximate reportable understanding of, uh, about our own bodies. So when you close your eyes, 
you can no longer see your arm, but you still know how it's positioned, how it can move. You have an intuitive understanding of your arm. It's never a truly accurate understanding of your arm. It's always a little approximate, but sometimes more than a little. Like if you have an amputation and there's no arm at all anymore, you may still have a phantom arm, which is the body schema continuing to represent the missing arm and the information that reaches higher cognition and verbal report. All right. About 12 years ago, in the middle of studying the body schema, I was thinking about attention. In particular, selective attention, the way the brain focuses on and deeply processes a, a small number of items at a time. Classically, people study visual attention, but you can also selectively attend to a sound or to a touch or to a sentence uh, or even to something internal like a thought or a, a memory. Attention is a lot like an arm. It, it moves around from one set of items to another in a complex way. And, and the brain controls it strategically. So at that time, I proposed that in order to monitor and predict attention, the brain must construct an attention schema. And the more I studied this attention schema, the more I realized that it plays a central role in, in human cognition. So what is an attention schema? It's a bundle of information that describes attention. If you could stick wires in the brain and extract information from someone's attention schema, it would tell you about the complex state that the person's attention is in. They would tell you, I know this item is a glow with attention while that item has less attentional glow. And all these items at the edge maybe have only a dim attentional glow. And predictively, it would also tell you what state is likely to come next. Attention is going to fade from here because that item is not very interesting. And it's likely to shift over there in the next moment. And finally, an attention schema would tell you about the predicted effects of attention on thought and behavior. It would tell you, aha, because the, the text in this book is intensely aglow with my attention, I'm likely to understand it and remember it for tomorrow. And it might tell you because that game of catch over there is only dimly in my attention, I, I'm not going to be able to dodge the ball very well if it flies my direction. So that's an attention schema, a descriptive and predictive model of attention. And I'll, I'll tell you about three specific consequences of having an attention schema, which parallel the case for the body schema. First, Having an attention schema should be useful for controlling your own attention. Uh, suppose you're reading a book and an annoying bee is distracting you and you, you want to sustain attention on the book and reduce it on the bee, but you still want a little attention on that bee in case it comes too close. You don't want it to sting you. This task is much easier if you have a system constantly monitors your attention to make sure it stays within the desired range on each object. And that predicts when your attention is about to slip. So it's called control engineering. You need a model of the thing you're controlling. And we know this is true. We know this must be true. In my own lab, we've built a deep learning neural networks that use simple forms of attention and move their attention spotlight around. And if you give those models an understanding of their, an attention schema, knowledge about their own attention, then they learn much better. They perform much better. And if you take away the attention schema, take away their, their inner information about attention, then they learn very poorly. 
And we think this principle must also be true in humans as well. So we have lots of data on human behavior. When you don't know what your attention is doing, when you're not tracking or monitoring or predicting your own attention, you still have attention. It still moves around. Uh, but your control over attention is, is, is compromised. It greatly suffers if you don't have that attention schema going. So that's one use of an attention scheme, a very crucial use. Second, building a model of someone else's attention should be useful for social cognition. It's, it's a part of theory of mind or, or intuitively knowing what other people are feeling and thinking. If you know what someone else is paying attention to and you know the rules of how attention moves and how it impacts behavior, then you gain a huge predictive advantage. You intuitively know what's in the focus of other people's attentive minds. And therefore, you know what's going to drive those people's behavior. And we know this is true. Again, we know this, this second branch coming out of the attention schema. We know this is true in people. There's decades of research showing that people are really good at building schematic models of other people's attention. We intuitively understand where other people are attending, how their attention is likely to move next, and so on. So we know that this is correct. We do build attention schemas to understand other people. And third, the attention schema should provide your higher cognition with an approximate reportable understanding of your own attention. And what I mean by an approximate understanding is the attention schema may be the source of our claims and beliefs and intuitions about consciousness. So let me expand on that. The, the, the brain's models are never accurate. They're always approximate. In this account, your brain constructs a schematic model of attention. It is. That's why it's called the attention schema. It's an inaccurate model. The model leaves out all the mechanistic details of how attention is really a, a, a competition between neuronal signals. According to that model, according to its imperfect detail poor version of attention, according to the attention schema, you possess an internal essence, a glow divorced from any physical mechanism. It just floats inside of you. The essence vividly, mentally takes possession of things, different things at different times, and it confer confers on you the ability to understand and react to those things. That's a schematic model of attention. And understand what I'm saying. Attention is a mechanism. It is physically understandable. But the attention schema does not depict it accurately. It does not depict the mechanism. Instead, it depicts something floaty and magical. And this is how people describe consciousness. People believe they have conscious experience. We're certain we have it. We claim to have it. And unless you don't believe in basic logic, then I think you have to accept that those beliefs and certainties are based on information in the brain. And the hypothesis presented here is that the relevant bundle of information computed automatically in a deep layer is the brain's schematic model of attention. The theory, therefore, pulls together three processes. First, the incredibly useful ability to control your own attention, without which you can't really function in the world. Almost everything that we do intentionally in the world requires us to control our attention and choose to direct our attention to one item or another item. And without that, we're almost unable to function in the world. 
Second, the incredibly useful ability to model other people's attention and make predictions about their behavior. And third, really the least important outcome. The theory explains why we're so certain that we have a, a magic essence of conscious experience in us. From the technological point of view, AST may help us build artificial intelligence that is more capable at strategically controlling its own attention and more capable at social interaction and social cooperation. And as a fun side effect, AST may lead to machines that think they have consciousness, machines that self-describe as having conscious experience. I would argue in the same way that the giant human neural network up in here thinks that it has conscious experience. I, I think the technology is close, very close, and yet also very far. I think something like chat GPT is showing that it has an amazing theory of mind an ability to build models of the mind states of other people. It can, in essence, attribute the property of consciousness to other people. It has the middle branch of this diagram here. Somewhere in its hidden layers, it's computing those models of other people. But it lacks human-like attention. It, GPT, lacks the limited capacity global workspace style of attention that people have. So even if you gave it a model of its own attention, it doesn't even have the same kind of attention that we have, the same attentional talents and weaknesses. <clears throat> and so it would never understand itself as having consciousness in the human sense. And so <clears throat> it's lacking the two side branches, the left branch and the right branch here, it's, it's actually lacking most of this structure. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think that's in principle very hard to build, but I don't think too many people are trying to figure out <clears throat> how to build human-like attention in AI. <clears throat> Currently, artificial forms of attention, transformers, they work really well. And so in a sense, you might ask, why would people replace it with a more limited capacity human style of attention? Anyway, that's some of the thoughts that I have on this topic. Normally in my talks, I have a second part, actually most of the talk, in which I review the neuroscience data and the human behavioral data that support each branch of this diagram but I'm not going to do that today. Instead, I wanted to spell out the basic structure of the theory and then give the rest of my time on the clock to questions because I think that's the most interesting and, and important part of the talk. And so I will end there and thank you all. Very happy to take questions. Amazing. All right. Hey, Michael. Hello. Hi, my name is Alan. I'm a product manager at Carbon Copies. I work for a couple of teams. We're working on creating the environment for full brain emulation. I have a question for you. So from my understanding of, of what you're saying, if what, what essentially like all living things would have to be conscious then, and there's like levels of consciousness that's determined by our, our existence and our evolution. Like, for example, like we have the consciousness to talk about consciousness, but like other animals can be conscious enough to find food is, is that is that a right way of, of understanding this? 
I think the, the thing we call consciousness, as I described here, comes from a mechanism related to attention. And all the attributes that we give consciousness are kind of somewhat distorted versions of the attributes that attention has. And indeed, in people, the two correspond. So what you are attending to, you are conscious of. What you are not attending to, you are typically not conscious of. And those track each other very, very closely, although not perfectly. So anything that has attention mechanisms, I think, has this potential. But that's not all living things. So attention is by no means everywhere in the living world. So really what this says is that things that have attention that's sophisticated enough that you need a model of attention in order to help control it. Those are the things that are going to have this property that we think of as our, our consciousness, right? And that's probably a limited part of the animal kingdom. It's probably vertebrates. It might be mammals and birds. You might have some reptiles in there, but you're not going to cover the whole living world with this kind of thing. So, so how does a honeybee not have the attention to approach a flower and pollinate it. Right. So I know there's a lot of work or a lot of speculation on honeybees in particular and honeybee consciousness, as it's called. First, well, I'm going to give two answers to that. First, I think people mix often complexity with consciousness. Like you can have a, a thing with very complex behavior. But you really don't know whether it would claim to have subjective experience if it could talk, right? We don't know that. And saying, oh, honeybees are very, very complicated, therefore they must be conscious, which is essentially the argument that many, many people have made. I don't buy that argument. Um, that's the first answer I would give. However, having said that, <laughs> the second answer is I don't think people really understand honeybees or insects in general. I think insects have independently evolved some form of attention. Uh, I think visual attention is present in a lot of insects. And I don't yet know, I think nobody yet knows just how sophisticated that attention is, how much control it needs, whether it needs a control model like an attention schema. And these are things that need to be studied. So honeybees are very interesting. I don't think it's known yet. Another animal model is the octopus which is also very interesting to me, where some of these properties may have evolved independently from, from our lineage. But I think the answer is nobody knows yet, and it's better to avoid the temptation of saying they're very sophisticated, therefore they must be conscious. Just, sorry, I'm chiming in here, but wouldn't it be better to avoid false negatives? Wouldn't you rather just assume that more things are conscious rather than less things are conscious than are actually conscious, just to avoid causing harm. I mean, there's an ethical question in there. And maybe from the point of view of ethics, you want to be risk averse. But then there's also a scientific question in there, which is just intellectually, are you sure? Or what, what can you figure out that's true or not true? And so from the point of view of a scientist, I would say, I don't, I don't know about insects or octopuses, and they probably don't have quite the same mechanisms we have, but they may have something similar. But sure, from an ethical point of view, you might say, hmm, should we really be chomping on octopuses? I don't know. Okay, got it. Thanks. Next one, we have Lisa Tiergaard. Yeah, thanks. Hi, thanks so much for your talk, Michael. Really interested about a lot of the things you said. And in particular, so I'm an alignment researcher who was formerly a neurotech researcher. And I was really curious about some of the statements you made regarding how AST could perhaps relate to AGI alignment. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if... You could tell us a bit about whether and how you think that ASC theory could contribute towards alignment. Well, I think that. So what alignment, what is alignment? The problem of alignment is basically how to get two different things to play well with each other, right? It's how to get this big artificial thing to play with humanity in a, in a pro-social and cooperative and friendly way. And so one of the ways, one of the things you can ask yourself was, well, how do people play well with each other? We evolved to be super social animals. And I know we have a tendency to go to war and do terrible things to each other. But by and large, actually, we're really cooperative as a species, unusually so among species. We're good at 
getting along with each other. We evolved with tools, mental tools that make us resonate with other people. And those mental tools, when you come right down to it, have to do with the fact that we can see consciousness in other people, right? It's called theory of mind. It's the ability to, to, to model what's going on in another person's mind and model what's going on in our own mind and see that there's a similarity and a resonance between those two, right? And this is at the heart of what makes us get along with each other. Uh, and, and I don't think I can possibly overstate the importance of that. This is the very heart, the foundation of all social cognition, all social behavior among people. And when you don't have that, then you are by definition a sociopath. That's what sociopaths are. They're people, they, a sociopath might build models of you. They might have really good predictive models of who you are and what you're going to do next so that they can manipulate you. But there's no resonance between that model of you and a model of themselves. And they don't see that similarity and they're not building a, essentially the same type of model and using it on both. So there's no empathy. There's no empathy, right? And so what are we doing when we build something like chat GPT? We're building a sociopath. I mean, that's by definition what we're doing. Chat GPT, as cooperative as it is and super impressive as it is, it's, it's kind of by definition sociopathic because it doesn't have empathy. Because even though it apparently can build models of other people's minds and is really good at that and the data emerging now seems to be, it has really good theory of mind. What it's doing is a little bit like when, so a person, so I know nothing about cars. I'm not a car guy, but I could learn. I could learn all about car engines. Then I could make predictions about how cars work based on my model of what's inside the hood, right? So I have a, I could have a theory of car, but I will never have empathy with cars because I'm not a car and I don't have the same machinery in me. And so there's no resonance between my model of myself and my model of the car. Chat GPT has theory of mind the same way it has theory of car. Like to it, it's all the same. It builds really sophisticated models of other people and other things, but those have no resonance with its model of itself because it doesn't operate along those same human-like principles. So at the very heart of AST, it's saying, in people, the core of how we get along with each other is that we have this common mechanism for modeling ourselves and modeling others. And so we attribute consciousness to ourselves and the same kind of consciousness to others. And we see ourselves embedded in this world of invisible mind stuff that other have people so many, have. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I have so many follow-up questions to this, but I'll try to <laughs> narrow it down to one. All right, which all right. Is what makes you think that machine consciousness would be human-like? Are there reasons to think that human and machine consciousness would be similar at all? And sort of as a sub-question to that, given that, let's say we succeeded to program in a model of human consciousness into an AI, what makes you think the AI would then care? to optimize for the human's perception or the human's consciousness rather than uh, something else? Right. So the first question, yes, I think it is possible for machines to have human-like consciousness. If this whole framework is right, that while we're dealing with this information structures and the way information is handled and processed, yeah, you could build these things to be human-like. I mean, they aren't right now. I mean, they are in some ways and not in others, but you could in principle do that, right? The chat GPT doesn't have anything like the structures we have in, inside our own minds that make us say, oh, I'm conscious. It doesn't have that insight. It's little or huge brain. So you could, you could build that in. I don't think that's a limitation. What I'm saying is if you build in these human-like tools and human-like structures, that it, sh it, the, it would, it should Logically, it would behave, therefore, in a human-like way. Uh, but I think you touch on something really important when you ask, why would it care? So a part of our human brain is emotion. And I don't think anyone really understands how to build emotion uh, yet, right? We don't understand the circuitry well enough to build artificial emotion. And so how you get machines to care 
or feel emotion at all, I think is still a bit of a mystery. But if you built it human-like, then it would behave like a human, kind of by definition. <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I have a bunch of follow-ups, but I don't want to take too much space here. So all I right, thank you, you so much. Sometime. Sometime. No. Yeah, thank you. Well, I just want to kind of reiterate maybe some of Lisa's points in your discussion. Randall did ask me to ask you specifically about GPT. I also just posted the sparks of artificial general intelligence paper here in the chat that you may have referred to when you said that they have pretty good theory of mind already of, of other humans. And so I guess my question would be that, I guess this is more like a normative question. I'm not sure if you are interested in answering this at all, but if you do think that uh, AIs would be so surpassed without having this kind of almost like feeling themselves as oneness in this consciousness, then, and you think that current AIs don't really have that, then do you think we should be creating systems that are more like that, that actually yes. have more human-like consciousness? Because if we do, then we also technically have some responsibility towards that, right? Yeah. And, my question to the octopus question that you already mentioned, where you said it's a different scientific question to a normative question. So I'm just curious about, yeah, any input you have on it. So, yes, I think it's very important to try to build in the same kind of structure. So evolution came up with a solution for making people get along with each other and be pro-social so that we don't go to a grocery store and just see a bunch of weird obstacles and, and mow them all down and go postal on them for no reason, just because they're objects, right? We don't do that. Evolution gave us those tools. I think we better give those tools to our machines before they get intelligent enough to get rid of us all. Uh, and that sounds like a joke, but it isn't a joke. It's like an actual, that's the alignment problem. I think that that's really important to do. And yes, I think if you give machines human-like properties and human-like consciousness, that is these structures that I'm talking about, attention and attention schemas and so on and so on, you're building something very sophisticated. Yeah, I think we have some responsibility to it. But I do come back to the question of emotion because we assume somewhat naively, if you're super intelligent, then you want to live and you want to be treated this way and you want this and you want that. Who, why, why, why does intelligence imply wanting? Like those are in a sense, two different things. We don't understand emotion well enough to program that into a machine. And so you could... That it, when we get to the point where we build machines that want and feel emotion and feel fear and feel love and feel joy and a desire to live, when it, whenever we get to the point where people understand the emotional circuitry in the brain well enough to duplicate it like that, then we're going to have a real ethical question on our hands. And then it becomes really our responsibility toward those machines. But I think that that's something that ramps up as the machines get more and more human-like in those ways. Well, I mean, not speaking about all emotions now, but like the kind of instrumental goal of seeking to stay alive and the goal of acquiring more resources slash power is usually one that is kind of subsumed in the instrumental conversion hypothesis within AI safety, which means that any goal, whether or not you're conscious, but like any agent trying to pursue any goal has these sub-goals, which are one staying alive and the other one being that you acquire more resources. Because those two are usually good for whatever other goal you may want to attain. And so that's not necessarily tied to emotion in my view. So I, I do think you can imagine a, like an unconscious being that nevertheless has a sub goal of staying alive. You're that's right. Thinking... That's right. But the ethics of it, when, when you think, I mean, to get really deep into the ethics of it, imagine the, somebody, somebody dies, it's a horrible moment and you just feel really terrible for that person. Why do you feel terrible for that person? It isn't because you're thinking there's a sub goal for living longer. You're thinking because that person doesn't feel, that person has an emotional content where they don't want to die. And you feel bad for that. You feel empathy for that person's emotion and for the people around that, the loved ones around that person. It's the ethical side seems to emerge largely out of the, the emotional resonance. Okay. One question, then I give it up to Michael. How would one do that? If you think that it's important to have, this more complex theory of mind really, that you've been discussing, how could one think about? So, yes, no, I, I, that, I, that, that's right. right. Yeah. That's the key question. And I think people right now are focusing very much on do machines have theory of minds? Can they read other people? And I think the answer is turning out to be yes. Um, and like I said, it's like theory of car. 
right? So what's missing is the machine doesn't have a similar mind and it doesn't have a theory of its own mind that is similar enough to its theory of other people's minds that it can build empathy and resonance between its understanding of itself and others. This is what these machines don't have. They can make predictions about other people, but they don't have the same structures inside. So the, the, that's what I think one has to focus on, giving machines more human-like attention and more human-like consciousness and on a more human-like structure in which the same kinds of mechanisms are being used to model itself and to model others. The, those are the, the properties of the human brain that one could build into machines that I think are actually really important, especially if you want them to get along well with people. I mean, I think it would improve everything, including just conversational fluency with people. I mean, those are kind of two different things, having your own theory of mind and being able to model within that theory of mind, the theory of mind of someone else. Yes. Uh, that, that's different. Do you, don't you think it could be enough for them to have their own theory of mind? Because there may be like a, a kind of like translatability between their theory of mind, even if it's very different than ours and that of other humans and the kind of space of imagining yourself as a conscious creature in a sea of other conscious creatures could just expand in that way, in ways that I, we don't we right now know yet. I think that's essentially right. That is one, do, I do, I, so I have empathy for other people, I hope. And it's not because I'm identical to them. And there's always differences between me and other people. Uh, and there's, there's all kinds of personality differences and emotional makeup differences and so on. But I have empathy with them because there's some things that are similar. And so if, you, if you're saying, well, can we give the machine some self-theory of mind so that it has its own kind of consciousness? That's giving it properties that are very human-like. Uh, and I think that's possible to do. And I think that's something that's not being done right now. And I, I do think that the more in the same domain as human thinking, the more you, you make the machine fit that human-like domain, the, 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 the more powerful that becomes, the more powerful that ability to interact well with other people. So I... Yeah, okay. I also have a lot more to say. For example, there's this case that Elias Zinkowski often makes, which is that we have to think of AIs as wildly better modelers of others than humans are, because in order to emulate well, like what someone else, or like what, what the next few tokens are, you need to kind of like almost monitor a very, very broad space. And then from that, zoom in on the particular thing you have to do. So arguably, I think they are like extremely well modeling a very, very broad yes. They're, they're good, good modelers of others, but they don't model themselves as similar beings to us if they model themselves at all. And that's the piece that's missing right now. And I don't think it's that hard a piece to put in place. And so AST basically gives a framework for thinking about that. But I think it's really important to do that because, you know, I think that they're actually, I think they're so, by definition, they're what I call obligate sociopaths. They can't help it. They're, they're built that way. And that's, I think, a problem. Okay, well, maybe I'll get another time to speak, but first, Micah and then Sarah. Actually, good segue into my question. When I empathize with my cats, is, are you of the belief that I am using a generalized model of myself to emulate that cat in my head? Is that kind of where you're going with this? I think that there is shared machinery. Actually, we know there is from looking at uh, scanning activity in the brain. So there is shared mm -hmm. machinery when you model yourself and understand yourself as a conscious being. And when you model your cat and understand your cat as a, as a conscious being. So a lot of the same networks are active. A lot of the same processes are going on. To some extent, you're inventing stuff that's probably not in your cat's head. So you probably are projecting stuff from yourself into the cat. And of course, to some extent, you're shaping and, and adjusting that model of your cat and saying to yourself, well, he's not exactly like me. He's stupider than me. And he's more interested in food and mice. So you adjust your model accordingly to try to fit the other creature. So it's not like a perfect, it's not like you necessarily have to see the cat as exactly like you, but you see similarities enough that you have this empathy ability there, right? So the people who are cruel to cats are people who don't do that, who don't see them in that way. So, so in theory for an AI, if we wanted alignment, we don't need it to perfectly line up with the human mind. No. We just need to get it close enough that it yes. sees us as 
similar enough to it. So it uses its own internal model of itself when it's, and maybe it even projects behaviors on us. Now they, they probably think like me. And that's, yes. That's enough, you think? Yes. Okay. That's what people do. That's the core of what, yes. Cats, though, share a biological substrate with us. So there's like some, it's like some it's similarity. Though. Yeah, but cats okay. do the same thing, of course. Like in their own little stupider way, cats are building these same models of us. Sure, but they also procreate or have to. That's part yeah. of how, like, part of what drives them. And AIs can copy themselves. So A, they don't share the evolutionary context that we do to evolve empathy. And B, they don't even share the same substrate that has the same, like, evolutionary goals kind of, like, in it. So I feel like there's just much more oh, of, I think the alien consciousness of an AI will just be very, very different, even if it has an internal model of itself and of us. Yeah, I wonder. There will be, there will be huge differences, but I don't know. I mean, there, there are, I, I, I mentioned octopuses. I love octopuses because they represent the most distant from an evolutionary point of view, the most distant creatures from us that evolved what you might call hyper intelligence. And so the common ancestor between us and octopuses might be as much as 700 million years ago. And they evolved independently, bigger and bigger brains, and they developed their own solutions. And I find them fascinating, but they have some of the same solutions they have to solve. That is, they live in a world, they interact with stuff in reality one way or the other. And, and so there's going to be some constraints that make their little brains and minds similar to ours. And I'm sure that AI can be very different. I mean, one could build it to be very similar. If one wants to optimize AI for the things it's good at, then it might be very different, but it still lives in the world that we live in. It still deals in the kind of physical reality of our world. It interacts with people. I mean, like arguably much of like empathy, at least according to Pinker, was developed because we need to cooperate and to cooperate, it's beneficial for us instrumentally to model another agent well. And through that, this instrumental goal, we developed these like kind of final goals of like actually having empathy for them because it was just instrumentally useful to be able to offer them better bargains and cooperation and negotiation. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine the same happening for AIs as long as we embed them in a structure that is like cooperative with humans and they kind of like need to, to some extent, give us a parade preferred uh, mm -hmm. bargains and negotiation games or whatever. Like I, yeah. Well, right. But I think that you can't ever get uh, empathy in an AI if it doesn't have a self model, because by definition, empathy is understanding the similarity between self and other and modeling other using some of the same mechanisms we use to model ourselves. That's kind of the definition of empathy. And so you have to have that substrate. And as for how AI evolves or develops, I guess my feeling is maybe we should be pushing it to evolve and develop in specific ways and not sort of just hoping it comes out one way or the other. There must be ways to to build the stuff so it has these properties. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I wonder if Sana, if your point is still relevant or otherwise, if Lisa, you want to chime in again, maybe Sana, is your point still relevant? If so, please feel to unmute. We've been waiting for a while and... Yeah, sure. Hi, and thank you so much for the presentation. This is perhaps a bit of a silly question, but I know you mentioned a few times that what we should be aiming to do is almost replicate human systems in AI. And I was wondering, I guess that reminded me of the concept of biomimicry. And someone like told me like, oh, you don't just want to replicate birds. Like we took planes was like inspired by birds, but we made it completely better. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I was wondering, do you think replicating the human brain is the best way to go about it? Or do you think perhaps like, solving specific problems as they come, not necessarily replicating or trying mm -hmm. to copy the human brain is a good way to do it. I think that's an excellent point. That's a super good point. So you, the case of birds is perfect. Birds have wings. The wings have a certain shape, the airfoil shape. One studies the engineering of that and takes the essence of what's needed to solve the problem of how to get the thing up in the air and sustained through sustained flight. And so you take the parts of the bird that you need that give you the solution you want. Uh, and I think the, so what is the solution we want here? We want alignment. We want some AI that's not gonna say, oh, 
I'm in a world of weird objects out there that I know how to manipulate, but are just alien objects to me. Can I just kill them all? Isn't that easier? Well, that's what we don't want. Like our goal is not to have that. Our goal is not is to make sure AI is not like a person walking across a lawn, crushing the grass under his feet because it's just grass and it's just things and who cares about the grass? It, the, it, there's no conscious minds in there. I don't care about it. It's not like me, right? So that's the goal. So now we ask, what is it? What can we take inspired by how people get along with each other? What are the attributes we can take that we can hope to build into these machines that make them able to cooperate in, in this empathetic way or pro-social way? And that's where AST has this very strong opinion, so to speak. Well, I have a strong opinion based on AST, which is that the heart of that, the, the heart of the solution that evolution came up with is the, the overlapping mechanism that we use to model ourselves and thereby attribute consciousness to ourselves and to model others and thereby attribute consciousness to others. Uh, and that's at the heart of all social interaction, all so social cognition and, and all empathy. So that's essentially taking that piece out and try to put it into the, the, the AI world. So we give it that particular skill. I have a question. Like, I know we have only have two minutes out, but it's okay. in, let's say Axel World's simulation of, let's say, like iterated games, right? Like the fact that Tid for Ted is like a relatively stable strategy. Like, how do you explain that? That's cooperative. Clearly, those very simple computer programs didn't have any consciousness to kind of like model that it's useful to cooperate. So I think that as long as we have something to offer to AIs in this comparative advantage situation where even if they are vastly more pow powerful than us, nevertheless, there may be some things that it would still be economical to outsource to us. And maybe there's something else that we can offer them. For example, we have the capital that they require to get better compute. Mm -hmm. what, like, we have something to offer them in like bargaining situations. And just because of that, it would pay off for them to be cooperative, whether or not they have exact experience of mind of us. Like, it, it could be, it could be. I would worry that we soon run into a situation where there's not much we can give them that they really need, right? I mean, the, the artificial machine world gets better and better at everything to the point where it's better than us at everything. To my mind, so here's an analogy that has been in my mind a little bit lately. If you look at, so let's say you're a settler in the old West in the, U, in the U.S. and you go out and you try to build your homestead and have your livestock and then there's wolves, packs, a pack of wolves comes and tries to kill your livestock. How do you handle the pack of wolves? One way is understand them well enough to go out and shoot them and kill them and, or poison them. That's it. They're done. They're annoying to you. You know how to get rid of them. Boom. Another approach would be Let's study them and understand their minds and their thinking and their packs and who's in charge and what their interrelationships are and which wolves are taking care of which pups. And if you follow that second path, pretty soon you're not, you have a relationship with those things. That's how you create an environmentalist instead of a wolf exterminator. And what, what, what I think is we, as, as AI becomes more capable and we become more like the annoying pests, the biological pests. Maybe I, I would rather have it rest on a foundation of actual understanding and empathy like we have with each other and like we have often with other animals rather than a contract of kind of a, some kind of concrete benefit that it gains from us that it might not have, that we might not be able to give it for very long. Okay, got it. I do think there's, for example, a causal, like in a causal society, like, Basically, it's a, it's a concept developed by Andrew Critch, including like open source game theory. And it's just like ability to model kind of like from an agentic perspective, very, very different minds in a way that's relatively universal. And even there, there's an argument to be made, or at least he did so on less wrong on a, a call normalcy that perhaps it is just kind of like relatively universal to model other entities in, in, in the setting where boundaries are universal coordination points. So at least something like respecting other entities' boundaries, whatever they may be, for humans physical, for AI is probably digital, could be something that is a universal kind of like a shelling point that very different entities could agree on, whether or not, or especially because they cannot very well model each other's internal states. But well, I, we could, yeah, we could try that. I mean, that's a good theory. 
but there's an enormous amount of evidence on what actually happens in the case of the neural networks that exist up here in people's heads. And we kind of know the conditions in which people depersonalize each other and, and find it really easy to murder each other when the contractualism breaks down. And we kind of know the conditions in which it gets very hard for people to treat each other badly because they've developed much more empathy and understanding for each other. And so I, I kind of look to that as a guide, like evolution has kind of solved the uh, essentials of that problem and, give, and given us the right tools. And we see what happens when those tools work and when they don't work right. And so that's, that's where I get this particular direction from. Yeah, perhaps you're saying like it's a preferred, safer strategy, but we can still try to blame the other thing if everything else fails, but like this. Right, right. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for staying three minutes longer. And this was really interesting. Thanks everyone for the wonderful discussions. I'm sure it was not the last time we talk about this. I'm really delighted you were able to join us. This was really fun. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And the same to you, everyone who's been listening in and asking questions. Thanks everyone.